days it's not the big who beat the small anymore it's those who choose to build a dream to wake and give it all it's not by accident or chance those who do succeed and it's no coincidence who they choose on their team better off let's get started better off on the course you charted better off with kelly partners better off better off let's get started better off on the course you charted Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for having me here today. We're a group that was started in 2006 to build and modernise accounting firms. Accountants are the key contact in the financial ecosystem and are absolutely critical to the good functioning of societies, but so often accountants don't understand their radically important mission. Our mission was to help them better understand that so that they could make their people, their clients and their communities that they operate in much, much better off. Now, better off to us is healthy, wealthy and wise. And if you um, see the numbers there, that those numbers are healthy for, for financial people. As we started the business, we did the pre-IPO round. We've been listed on the Australian Stock Exchange through 20, since 2017. And I would often get busy people who didn't have time to read something that could get, give them a good return, say to me, Brett, could you just explain the company in one slide? So we came up with this slide. Um, it's a business that has consistently grown its revenue, that has very strong margins, EBITDA margins of on average 30%. Um, parent NPAD A runs at about 10% of uh, group revenues with a strong balance sheet, lightly geared, and 100% cash conversion, strong um, cash flows. Importantly, we have 45 million shares on issue. Um, we haven't issued any more shares to, to acquire companies and we don't intend to. And so we have a strong um, focus on growing returns per share for our shareholders. We're building a business system that knows how to grow. The business has doubled on average every 3.2 years, five times in a row. And so for us, we have this double-double mentality of saying, yeah, yeah. how can we double the business in the next three years? How can we double the business in the three years after that? And so we don't think it's an accident that the business over nearly 18 years has delivered these types of numbers. Our focus is annuity income streams. We think that as Westerners all try to retire at the same time, that annuity income streams will become increasingly valuable. And the two certainties in life are death and taxes, and both sides of politics, left and right, like to increase taxes and like to increase complexity. So the role and criti critical nature of the accounting function we think is going to dramatically increase. Over the last 10 years, 50% less people have studied accounting and 50% less uh, and, uh, and there's been a reduction of 50% of those people going into public accounting, and so we expect really strong pricing power over the next decade. So we're very focused on just doing those things for the family-owned business that typically keep their accountant for 30 years um, and, and ultimately deliver annuity income streams into the business. There's a very large addressable market in Australia, in the US and the UK. We have 34 office locations. 70 um, partnerships transactions to date. We don't call them acquisitions, we call them partnerships, importantly, and then we do that under one brand. So most importantly is that accountants feel very bad about themselves because they don't understand why they exist. They don't understand the critical mission that they play within the economy and the difference that they make to people and businesses. So 70% of all Australian, US and UK people are employed in private businesses. 90% of small businesses fail in the first decade. Those businesses are typically secured against family homes. And when those family businesses have trouble, the families behind them have real trouble. And, and that's horrendous. So business failure causes family failure very often. And 77% um, of all Americans, I think this is true in most parts of the West, feel strong financial anxiety. So if you can convince your accountants that they can really play a role in reducing the individual sense of financial anxiety, that the business owner's sense of um, the importance of the business owner and why we should really make an effort to help them, and the real risk that business owners are at, 
then you've got accountants who have huge potential and they can really lock in and deliver a different level of service to the clients. The thing that most differentiates our business is this understanding of this mission, that we really only exist and we really only will exist if we're committed to making business owners, our clients, private business owners, our people and communities better off. We're very clear in terms of bringing people and partnerships into the business, that we want people that have three core values, that they are people for others, not self-centred, that they are people that keep their promises, not people that can't, which is quite prevalent. And finally, we need people that are convinced that a team can do more than an individual. Um, and so if you get people that are people for others that keep their promises, um, that can play as part of a team, that's a very powerful group of people. And then, you know, in terms of the vision, um, the top 15 economies in the world, Australia's the 13th largest, it's the only economy that doesn't have a global accounting firm, and Australians are very global in their orientation, of, are leaders in most industries that they participate in, but um, there's no global accounting firm, so we think we should be that. The business itself, we know that there's shrinking tax-based demographics, there's ongoing government budget deficits, societal pressure to increase personal taxes, competitive pressure to reduce corporate taxes, increasing tax compl complexity, compliance and collaboration, use of digital tools to track people, etc., and heightened corporate disclosure. And so while the multinationals of the world don't pay tax and, and poor individuals don't either, it's the private business owners that are under real pressure and need real help. In Australia, um, and in most Western countries, the proportion of lawyers that are in our parliaments has grown at an exponential rate, which means the number of pages in the Tax Act has grown on average at 13% compound per year for 50 years in Australia, resulting in a 10,000-page tax, uh, 10, tax Act that's completely unreconcilable. And so AI we don't see as a, as a particular issue for our clients because the law is first proclaimed by word, then by um, verbally, then then in legislation and then argued out in courts over the next 10 years. Australia's the 25th hardest place in the world to pay tax, even if you want to, and most people don't. So we're focused on the SME sector because they're long-term relationships. They keep their accountants for 30 years, um, and you really become an extended part of the family, and they're highly recurring revenues. It's a highly fragmented market. We'll leave the big four to be the big four. We see the second tier of having really a, a, a model that's un, unfit for modern purposes. And, and there's this small private firm market that really is the bulk of firms. There's 35,000 firms in Australia, 60% are in there. There's 12 billion. You can times that by 15 for the US and that by six for the UK. The markets are structured exactly the same. And the big driver is the firms are largely, the equity of the firms is largely owned by baby boomers who are looking for a succession solution, which is the expertise that we've developed. So there's a significant runway for growth globally. So the firm as it, as it stands is we knew that it, we could distinguish ourselves by our commitment to our mission and values, um, that we could focus just on this SME market and focus we think is really important rather than going broad and trying to be everything for every, everyone. We have a 51-49 10-year partnership agreement structure that we've invented and trademarked called the Partner Owner Driver Model which is very, very differentiated. We have a centralised back office that the officers pay for so that the partners actually have execution capacity to do the things that they said they would one day do, which never ha happened because the business is a subscale and they don't have a team. And then we have a proprietary system for the clients, a single brand and um, some services that make sense. High ratings across people, services and clients. Um, the great news is Warren Buffett, who's a real hero of mine, says that you should try to step over you know, one foot hurdles. Um, the, the level of quality of operation of accounting businesses is so low, it's not that we think we could do it better, but we knew we couldn't do it worse. And so, that was a joke, somebody got that. Um, strong financial performance, uh, we've got a short amount of time, there's a fair bit to share. Um, we've outperformed the market. These are the companies, some that we really admire. Um, our heroes are really Buffett and the whole co structure. Um, Mark Leonard for asset alloc allocation, um, uh, Bernard Arnault for his ability to buy businesses that are old and rejuvenate them, and David Ogilvy for his ability to build a global professional services business. We're doing okay. I think it's a business that if you look um, deeply at, you will, um, you'll like what you see. CBIS is a US comp. Our, our ROE is you know, 26 versus 15, our ROIC is 24 versus 12, and it's a pretty well-performed business over the last 20 years. 
In terms of investment highlights, it's a mission-driven organisation with industry-leading disruptive operator in highly um, fragmented accounting services market. You can read all that in your spare time. Essentially, ex excep exceptional track record of discipline, founder-led growth, annuity-style revenue. It's got a unique partner-owner driver model, significant runway for growth, and, and a you know, founder-led company with proven ability to, to deliver strategy and generate strong returns. We think that we're imminently likely to be the 10th or 11th largest firm in Australia. We think that that gives us a very good um, basis to grow globally, first into LA and then into London. They are the two big Australian expatriate markets. In Los Angeles, there are 60,000 Australian businesses, and until we recently bought two businesses there, there wasn't a single Australian-owned accounting firm. So the opportunity, we believe, is real. It's similar in, in London. If we can get the spine right, we think we can put some muscles on it over the next decade. We're trying to prove that we have a business system. Um, a, a business that we very much like is a, a business called Danaher that I'm sure many of you uh, are familiar with, but the business we like more than that's McDonald's. And so McDonald's is a very system-led business. Most businesses are 80% systems, 20% brilliance. We've really worked very hard on the systems in the business. Our programmatic um, partnership model is very, very disciplined. It's two to $10 million firms. It's a 51-49, 10-year partnership. It's really a funnel of trying to get people to not join rather than to join. We just want the people that share our mission. And so there's pretty stringent requirements to join the team. We've bought one in 20 firms that we've looked at. We've looked at more than 1,400 firms in the last 17 years, and we have a database of about 36,000 firms with about 146 in the funnel currently. The annuity revenue I've mentioned, um, there's really partnership diversification, client diversification, location diversification. They're all in special purple purpose vehicles. It's a diversified portfolio of private businesses that happen to be accounting firms um, where we know we can really add value. This is our unique um, partner on a driver model. This is the runway that we see for growth. We know that we're not trying to do the take the rocket to the sky and learn how to make it land. Um, there are many global accounting firms. There just isn't an Australian one, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Partnerships versus acquisitions. In the 35 seconds I've got left, um, we we just, you know, we would share that unless somebody shares our values, then they're not worth talking to, and we're very clear about that, and we're very good at spotting that. There's no more than five regional offices that overlap with KP offices. All offices need to be owned, so there's a clear funnel. I really love in the REQ book that um, that they published on programmatic acquisitions that. You really need to have a playbook in each area. We have a playbook and a very, very developed playbook over 70 acquisitions in this space. So if you've read some of these books, you'll understand our business. I started at Pricewaterhouse. I was in the EVA group. I read Alfred Rappaport's book on creating shareholder value, and I realized that accounting firms have a 35% EBITDA margin with a cost of capital in our group of about 8%. And so if you run them and you can grow them at better than 5%, you're probably going to create a fair amount of um, shareholder value over time, which is certainly our focus. I'd like to finish with this little text I got yesterday. This is an, a privilege position to be in to lead a business of exceptional people that that I do. Um, it is a singular privilege of my life, other than being married to my beautiful wife and, my, and having our three children. It's really the thing that I love to do. I get a text yesterday, hey Brett, here's an, another interesting fact. KPG at $7 yesterday was exactly 50 times return since I invested in 2007 from our first external and very grateful shareholder. Um, if you look up the business, I think you'll like what you see. And as I love to say, have a great day. The focus of this panel uh, is entering new markets. And uh, I just uh, want to go through all of your journeys a bit. I mean, starting with Joan, uh, I think a key change you made over the last four or five years is to buy high margin businesses and You've also made a lot of acquisitions outside, um, outside Sweden during this time and, and recently entered the, the DAG region. Uh, and Brett, you started up in, in Australia, but you have a strong focus on growing in, in California now. And Magnus, you saw more opportunities in the UK and Finland when prices became a bit too high in, in Sweden. So 
focusing on this, can, you, can we begin with you, one? I mean, I mean, talk about how you worked on, on building a brand. So let, the first question will be on, on brand building in a new market. So uh, you want to kick off? Sure. Uh, our journey really began when we moved outside Sweden, as we did have companies in Sweden. So in terms of uh, expanding our business, then we started to look upon, OK, Norway, Finland, there's a cultural and historical context with those countries in Sweden. And there, as our strategy is very focused around the entrepreneurs and the values they represent, uh, and that must be a match with the company. And that means that when you move into a new market and you're unknown, then of course you have to be totally convinced that the first company that you partner up with are sharing your values, because if you make a bad, <laughs> bad company or bad mistake or bad investment in the beginning, then the face or the brand of the company, you will per be perceived as the local company, not as the company back home in Sweden. So the, the people, the entrepreneurs who are in charge of the company in which you choose to invest when you move into a new market is really, really critical. Uh, then, as we started to look upon, should we move away from the Scandinavian countries and looking upon Germany? Then there was a totally different setup because I did have some experience previously with Germany. And then, of course, Sweden, that's in the northern part of, of, of Europe. We have the SCK, we don't have the Euro and stuff. So that means when we moved into Germany, there we spent almost two years preparing ourselves, building a platform before we entered into Germany. That means you need to speak German, you need to have the, the German homepage, you need all the advisors, you need to have local German employees, you need to have an office. That's the platform that we built before entering into that particular market. But then in terms of choosing the right partner to move into, into the German market with, that is equally important as in Sweden, Norway, and Finland. So there's no difference in the quality that you are looking for. And we are also prepared to pay a little bit more for the first investment we are making, making sure that this is really the right partner to, to, to move into that market. We do have competitors to ha who have done it differently. And when you try to do the second and the third investment, yeah, the good players won't talk to you. So it's from our perspective, given the strategy we have, right people, that is the key number one. So Brett, any similarities or, or differences on, on your journey? I, I, I think that's really well put. I, I think that um, deeply understanding the market's really important. In the research we did on the US market, um, when Australian companies had tried to enter the US, they really made two mistakes um, with all the people that we spoke to. One was treating the US as if it was a market where you needed to participate in every state. Um, it's such a big um, market that um, it was clear to us that we needed to um, focus on California. It's the fourth biggest economy in the world. And then rather than try to own California, just go deep in Los Angeles and try and own the Los Angeles market for accounting to private businesses with two to 200 million um, and buy firms with two to 10 million. So just deep, 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 deep focus. Second thing that came out was that um, companies, Australian companies hadn't been successful in those markets when the CEO didn't relocate to that market. Americans are, are known to be um, confident about themselves and focused on their local situation is a gentle way to put it. And so they're not as outward looking as say Australians are because they frankly don't need to be. And so if you send a junior to, to talk to um, a potential partner, they, they won't, you know, you really give up a lot of advantage. So key to our situation was that my son is 18, he wanted to go to college in the US, my wife wanted to move to the US, um, and we could see that direct off, um, flight, Sydney, LA, um, and, you know, really an untapped, large, deep market. So um, the fact that I was prepared to be there has meant that um, the opportunity set has, has, is exponentially larger than it otherwise would be, and people take you much more seriously. So I, I would you know, echo the comment that you do need great counterparties. We've been incredibly blessed in that respect, and um, you need to be very, very serious about who the first people are that you partner with. Uh, we're not prepared to pay more for a new partner. Um, in fact, um, 
we think that if you want to be part of what we're doing, then you should demonstrate that commitment by not looking for the highest price. Um, and so we're, we're pleased that we've been able to buy into both of these situations at, at, at um, prices and on terms that, that are aligned with what we do in Australia and make sense. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting. It gives energy to the, the core business, which I think is often overlooked, and it gives a greater career pathway to our talented people so that you're more likely to keep them in your ecosystem long term. Uh, and Magnus, then, uh, um, I mean, you, you operate more of a, a, a niche acquirer, so, I mean, there are not so many synergies and similarities between the companies, even though they may be in, in, in the same industry sectors and, and niches. But how do you think about this topic, about really having feet on the ground in the markets, geographical markets you enter? Now, I, I want to add one aspect. It's actually we're only acquiring, you know, well-managed, uh, highly profitable companies. And, and typically, they have got a lot of approaches already from some other players. So I think you shouldn't underestimate the, the, the importance of being a credible buyer. Mm. Uh, they actually, you know, uh, they would like to be part of your group. They kind of appreciate uh, to be, you know, uh, part of something bigger. And, and then to have, you know, some credible evidence that you are that partner is really important. And of course, if you're entering a new market, we have been more active, for example, in Finland and the UK during the last years. It helps when we already have also subsidiaries within our platforms based in the UK, because they can tell the true story. How is it to be part of Berman or Beving? And, and, and that is really important, I think, to be an attractive uh, buyer. It's not only what we you know, think we would like to be, it's, it's them to want to be part of our group. And that's also left, I, I agree with you, we don't overpay outside our valuation kind of criteria when we enter new markets. It's more like we're having this soft offering that want them to join us. And it's not money that is the, the key to that, it's to be part of something bigger. So I'm curious to know if the economics of your business has changed at all when you go into new markets. Is it, you know, maybe start with you, Brett, you've gone in. Is it a basic accounting firm, the profitability different in different markets, or how's that change? Yeah, so the, the average EBITDA of an accounting firm in Australia, the UK, and the US is between 18 and 19% self-reported. It's probably 15% if they were public company audited. And so there's a real consistency in terms of the structure of of the market, who participates, you know, if you psychologically profile the accounts in each market, they'll be the same person and their performance is the same. The way the businesses is organised is the same. It's more expensive for us to participate in the market than it is in our home market because of the size of the business and the scale that we have in Australia. And so, you know, I'm flying people in um, from Australia. We've now moved one of our key people from Australia into the US, which is, she's been there since last Thursday. And, you know, I've, I've sort of led the charge to prove the business model and, and now other people want to come, which is, you know, um, is really excellent. But in the first 12 months, you're flying people in and out and so you are investing in a different way than we are currently in Australia. When I look back to how we invested initially in Australia, it, it's very similar to the, the initial build out of Australia in that everything costs more um, than you expect and more than you want it to cost. Um, but because now we've got the confidence of the return profile of the businesses, we're, we're not concerned. So what was the que question again? About will the economics of your business change in different uh, markets? So you, yeah. In terms of profitability, I believe that the difference between the individual companies is actually a bigger proportion than the profitability per se in a particular market, because you do have good and bad players in each market. Mm. I think as all the three of us are agreeing upon, that is that we are looking for the very best players. We don't buy turnaround cases, company culture, the match, and so forth. Those are very critical criteria that they really fit into the company structure you already have. We do use the local entrepreneurs as ambassadors, so we go through them when we are screening and looking for new companies, because they know their colleagues uh, in, in the local geography. So, and, and we always use our, our uh, uh, existent, existent entrepreneurs as uh, advocates for us. And when we are in discussion with uh, a potential new investment, then of course we always leave references. So they do call 
the company owners that have sold their company into Green Landscaping Group. So you get good references, and that means you, have to be, you must be truthful because if you are saying one thing, trying to buy a company, and they have all been approached. This is not like a virgin market. Everyone has been approached multiple times by different types of buyers. And that means you have to bring something to the table, and that goes back to your point there, that there are, if everybody's paying the same amount of money, but you have to offer something that fits into their future as individuals. What's the life going to look like in the coming three, four, five, six, ten years? Do they have kids who can take up the companies? So as soon as you have like a market value for the company that you have the discipline that you're paying, and that's kind of a given that this is a market price for the company, then you have to bring in above and beyond what everybody else can bring, in to, bring to the table, so to say. So they actually pick you instead of someone else. And we put a pride in not being the highest buyer, or highest the company that pays the most money for the company. So we like to be number two, number three, and they still choose to go with us. That's really a home run to us. Um, a a follow-up question on what you mentioned. I mean, the interpretation I guess this, uh, get is that when you enter a new market, it takes, I mean, it takes time to build a brand. Uh, you, you start buying a, a few companies. Uh, they help you with their relationships, their network in finding new companies. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to know, I mean, for you, Magnus, on like having the broker relationships uh, in a new country versus your own sourcing when you, I mean, when you start from the beginning, how do you, how do you build that? Yeah, I just want to comment one thing you said, it's so difficult. I don't think it's so difficult <laughs> and, and you don't need to spend so much time uh, building your brand actually. It's more about mm -hmm. connecting with a separate, you know, uh, company and a separate owner and building that, that relationship. We don't talk about big investments, you know, getting into new markets. It's more like building a relationship with, with uh, companies. Um, and that, of course, takes a little bit more time when you get into a completely new market, but for me, it's not a very big difference, actually. Um, sorry, what was your other question? <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so building the broker relationships as yeah. well. I mean. And of course, when you have made a lot of acquisition in the country, uh, then you get on the radar screen on the brokers, and, and then, then you get uh, you know, a more consistent uh, mm. flow from, from the dealers. Th that's the thing. Uh, but, but I think, um, of course, and the more present you are in the market, the more opportunities there are. But, but for us, it's not kind of a limitation, at least. So, so we can move slowly, and, and we are quite happy with the geographies we are currently present. We have uh, more to do there, so, so it's not kind of that we look into new markets, you know, or, uh, every every quarter or every year. Uh, that's not necessary, actually. So, what about uh, how do you handle the added complexity of going to new markets? You have new rules and taxes and all that sort of thing. So, how do you deal with the added complexity of doing that? Uh, well, once again, I mean, there are some differences, but they are not that uh, big, actually. At least not when we work. You know, we are focused mainly in the, in the Nordics and in the UK, and, and there are much more similarities than differences. So, it's, mm -hmm. it's not really a, a big issue either. Mm -hmm. Of course, you need to be diligent and, and really to get to, to know the differences and, and uh, handle those differences, but it, it's, it's not a big effort. How about anybody else there, Yuan or? No, it's pretty much the same, same. That, that the culture differences, but that you have to appreciate that when you are in Norway or in Finland or in Sweden or in Germany, you have to adapt to the local customs, you have to adapt to the local culture to be there. And as I did mention, we did make an effort in terms of moving into Germany because there are some differences between Sweden and Germany that is not prevailing between uh, within the Scandinavian countries. Then in terms of the technical part of it, I agree, that's kind of, yeah, you have different tax laws and stuff, but that's something you just have to deal with and make in an, an, an efficient way mm -hmm. to, to, to facilitate the transaction in, in, in a good way. So that's kind of where you're bringing in the expertise, but that, that's not the focus. The focus is really about finding the right people, what value do we bring to the table, and we're going to live together, work together with them for the coming 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So it needs to be the right people that you team up with. And, and my next question is maybe not, uh, I mean, entirely like when you enter new markets. I mean, this is a question when you buy a new company overall. I mean, uh, Brett, you mentioned the Danaher business system. I think you and you also yep. are influenced by we Danaher. Do, we do work with Danaher as well. Yeah, and Magnus, you, you have your focus model. So, I mean, 
how how is that process to I mean to to educate the businesses you buy about the system you have? We can start with you, Brett. So creating an understanding in the business that you're partnering with by asking them what's wrong with their business works incredibly well. Everyone knows what they should do to be healthy, wealthy and wise and everyone knows what they should do to run their business better. So asking people, you know, what would you do with your business if you could do anything at all, they'll give you the list. And after somebody gives you the list, they very much appreciate your team solving their problems. If you walk in and say, look, you have problems, why don't I solve them? That's not a great <laughs> way to behave. But if you say to people, hey, you're really, you know, we're dealing with CPAs, chartered accounts, they're intelligent people. What is it about your business that you would make better if you could? Can you give us the list? And so they, they will typically write us a list. We literally put them in a room and ask them to give us the list. And we say, okay, would you appreciate us working with you to solve those problems? That's part of a 204 step checklist that we have developed over nearly 20 years. Um, but we don't lead with the checklist. We just say, hey, can we solve, you know, have you got any problems now? If we find businesses that don't have any problems, then we can't add any value. So it's very important through the relationship build and the due diligence that we understand what specifically could we do that adds real value, but it has to come from, from you know, the, the firm that we're looking to partner with. And then, frankly, if you get in to solve their problems, they, they, they're absolutely ecstatic that somebody's finally been able to help them. They're subscale businesses without a management team, in effect. And so we have 34 people in our central services team and we just go in there and help them do the things that they know that they should be doing, which is, you know, very rewarding for everyone involved, to be frank. You want, do you see the similarities or differences there? For sure, it depends on the, because with the starting point was really about the attitude. Do you bring in help or you tell them how they should run the business? And if you try to tell a good entrepreneur how they should run the business, well, that's kind of a short discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to be selling what you are doing. And initially we thought that organically we should have some benefit from it because we have companies who are making 20 plus percent and we have companies at 5% margin. And then we thought that, okay, bring those groups, uh, those people together, that it organically should solve itself. To some extent it did, but not to extent that satisfy the, the let's say, yeah, it, it took too long time. So we ended up developing a playbook where we're basically doing a lessons learned, how do you manage a business in this area, what's the internal processes like, and so forth. And then you have that all documented. And then when you sit down with the entrepreneur on the early, let's say the first 90 days, then you ask, okay, how can I make your life easier? Then you dive into how are they conduct in business, how do they run their business? And typically you end up with an entrepreneur who works 60 to 80 hours a week, and he's doing, in our case, quotations and tedious stuff. Why can't you delegate? Well, the more people is not good enough. Now, okay, then you kind of know. The, so you, you talk to them, you look upon where is the heartache, or what, the, what do they struggle with, and then you offer a kind of a solution. Okay, let's, we have other companies who have done it like this. Would that be a possibility and so forth? So you're basically already knowing the issues, but you are selling the solution to them, or they can discover it themselves, and then you can come in and help them with that particular uh, process or whatever internally. So it's about selling the help and make the company improving the business. And lastly, then Magnus, uh, one one minute answer on uh, on the focus model. I mean, I guess many many of the companies you buy, they they still, I mean, they're still laser focused on getting the high high margin uh, as high margins as they can get. But I can guess that on the working working capital side, I mean, you can help them a lot with actually thinking about how to improve their working capital situation. Yeah, our, our focus model, that's our capital allocation model. That's actually how we can prioritize where to invest and, and uh, the priorities for the companies. And, and of course, we only buy well-managed, uh, highly profitable companies. So they all have the matrix in place already. Uh, but as you said, sometimes they, they haven't optimized the working capital. So that's typically, I would say, the, the main potential uh, we can bring to the table, uh, how, how to work on that in a more efficient way without kind of disturbing the business, because you need to be curious. They, they are good, smart people, have been building this business and run it for many years in, in a very good way. 
So, so it's very dangerous, I think, to get in, and I know better, and I, uh, yep. let's do it in our way, <laughs> because uh, that is proven as well. I think you need to be very cautious and, and take it step by step, and, and really make sure that you have the management uh, along. Perfect. Thank you so much, right. all of you, Thank for you. your presentations and, and the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.